Business. We'll now move on to the matter of urgency. I'll give senators a moment to check, clear the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 22 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Chisholm proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 17 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. This morning I heard from Susan, an aged care worker. Now, Susan has been working in the aged care sector for 17 years. And she says that the facility she currently works for is at breaking point because of the pandemic and because of the government's failure to support that sector throughout this critical Omicron phase. Staff shortages means that she finds herself solely responsible for a floor of 40 elderly people. And when two or three or four buzzers go off at the same time as they always seem to do, she actually has to decide who she is going to help, whose needs she is going to prioritise, who is most important. She has to take responsibility. She has to make a choice. She doesn't have the option that Prime Minister Morrison gives himself time and time and time again, and that is to say that it's someone else's problem to shrug the responsibility off onto someone else. I mentioned Susan because this morning, to meet with her, I had to go past a large crowd of people outside the parliament who are angry about life-saving vaccinations and angry about public health measures associated with the pandemic. Now, this is a group of people that coalition members, members of the coalition party room, members of this Senate, have been directly speaking to and encouraging for some time. It's been reported that some of the coalition party room were down there at the rally in person. Senator Rennick in the media is reported to have said, and I'll quote this, that he is working to make sure, working to make sure that our children aren't vaccinated. Well, you'd think, wouldn't you, that the Prime Minister might be concerned that members of his party room were spreading vaccine misinformation, spreading misinformation about the safety of vaccines. If not that, you'd think he might be concerned that members of his party room are addressing protests whose leaders have publicly called for the violent overthrow of state and federal governments and the murder of public servants. Apparently, he's not concerned about that, not interested in that. He's silent. It's not his responsibility, not his problem. It's a shame, actually, that the Prime Minister didn't meet with Susan, because if he did, he could have learned something, something about what it means to take responsibility and make difficult decisions. Actually, calling out vaccine misinformation and extremism shouldn't be a difficult decision. It should be an easy choice for any leader with integrity. The reasons provided by the government for the cancellation of Novak Djokovic's visa actually spell out why it's dangerous for someone with a high profile and status to be stoking anti-vax sentiment. In the government's own words, and I quote, it may encourage others to emulate him. If others were encouraged to take up or maintain resistance to vaccination or to COVID-19 restrictions, then that would present a problem for the health of individuals and the operation of Australia's hospital system. They go on to say this, his presence may lead to rallies and protests that may themselves be a source of community transmission. 
Well, they're the issues when it came to Mr Djokovic. But we've had members of the coalition party room doing all of these things and, in fact, much more. We've had false medical claims and distrust of science being provoked by Senator Rennick. He said this, all the data that says that they're neither safe nor effective. What data is he referring to? He goes on, on the basis of this false claim, to say it is criminally negligent to roll out booster shots without any attempt at rectifying these serious safety issues first. Well, if distrust in science and medicine isn't bad enough, we've then had Senator Antic, who's been out there peddling distrust in government. And here's a quote from Senator Antic. Power-hungry bureaucrats and a largely pedestrian media have fuelled fear in our community for two years. And on the rallies in Canberra this week, he said, we are with you all the way. Well, Mr Christensen, serial offender, went further and said yesterday, I've watched with pride over the last few days as thousands of Australians uprooted their lives and drove to the nation's capital to send a message to all politicians, we want our freedoms back. Now, that's an unsurprising statement in some ways. Mr Christensen gave a speech last year comparing vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions to a totalitarian regime. He then called for civil disobedience. And this was at a time when protesters were constructing gallows at the front of a, fed, at a state parliamentary building. It comes on top of two years from Mr Christensen of boosting unproven and dangerous alternative COVID treatments. Now, during the time that Mr Kelly, Mr Craig Kelly, was a member of the Coalition Party Room, the Prime Minister stood idly by while he disseminated false COVID information, misinformation, on social media. Facebook has taken more action against Mr Kelly than the Prime Minister. Well, why hasn't the Prime Minister done anything? Well, when asked why his government had acted on Novak Djokovic and not coalition backbenchers, Mr. Mr Morrison said this, you're conflating two different issues. In Australia, if you're an Australian, you're a citizen, you can be here and you can express your views. Well, what a hollow and vacuous response that trivialises the issues at stake. It also serves to minimise the Prime Minister's responsibility, because the truth is that they are not merely Australian citizens, are they? They are members of the Prime Minister's party room. They are members of the government that he leads. He ought to take responsibility for their behaviour. Deputy Prime Minister Joyce took time out from texting to say this, what can we do? As, Immigration Minister Alex Hawke, as much as Immigration Minister Alex Hawke would like, he can't send any of our politicians to Serbia. Again, what a trivial response, because he's right. That's not an option for the PM. But I'll tell you what the Prime Minister could do. He could publicly rebuke them. He could have called them out in the party room meeting. Happened this week or in any other week. He could have cornered them for a private conversation, like he did with Bridget Archer, when Ms Archer had the temerity to cross the floor last year. Why hasn't he done anything like this? It's pretty obvious, because there is nothing in it for him. Because, as former Premier Berejiklian allegedly wrote, the Prime Minister puts politics before people. He never takes responsibility. But the Prime Minister's silence matters. The government's federal court submissions in the Djokovic matter make the point that anti-vaccine rhetoric can have a real impact on the health of individuals and the operation of Australia's health system. It means that people like Susan, the aged care nurse, have even more elderly and sick patients to care for and more difficult choices to make about who they are able to care for. But I tell you what, the health of our public debate matters as well. Any success that we have had in combating this pandemic is due in no small part to the willingness of the Australian people to band together and to make sacrifices. Australians have worn masks. They have stayed home from work and school. They have rescheduled their weddings. And heartbreakingly, some of them have had virtual funerals. The statements by some members of this coalition undermine that solidarity. They undermine the faith in science 
that has delivered the vaccines and the public health measures that have saved tens and thousands of Australian lives. And they undermine the trust in government and our public institutions that we will need to deal with the next pandemic or the next strain of this virus or indeed the next crisis that we confront as a nation. Because the problem is broader than the pandemic. By encouraging and standing beside extremists, government members and senators are legitimising them. There is something qualitatively different about protests that call people traitors, that seek to dehumanise them. And we've seen where that kind of politics leads in our history and in our global history. And it's not to a democratic place and it is not to a safe place. A leader of any integrity would call out the members of his own government who are spreading COVID misinformation, vaccine hesitancy and encouraging violent protest. But where is Mr Morrison? There may be nothing in it for Mr Morrison politically, but he should use the weight of his position to defend the integrity of our public debate, because that is the right thing to do. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Macdonald. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise in defence of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, not just for my colleagues, but for every single person in this place and indeed all of Australia. Western civilisation has been founded on the freedom to speak out, but Labor does not believe in free speech. Labor doesn't care about people, only ideologies that deny freedom for every parent, business owner, religious person and farmer. Surely the ability for every Australian to be fully engaged in this pandemic and its response is not only a good idea but it is a necessary idea for our mental health and for our recovery uh, from this situation. This is the most left-wing Labor opposition we have seen in decades. And after the last election, it's lurched, if possible, even more to the left. They're quick to condemn conservative politicians for speaking out, but silent when those of the left support Invasion Day, anti-Christian rhetoric, shaming of conservative women and calls for quotas. How many Labor and Greens MPs support socialism, communism, violent left-wing groups such as Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Do these groups get to express their views but others can't? Labor's double standards are a joke. Now, I don't agree with the stance taken by Mr Christensen and Senators Rennick and Antic, but I will fight every day for their right to represent those, those Australians who share their views, because Parliament should be the one place where we can have an open and vigorous debate, where we can contest ideas. This idea that these people are calling for harm upon pol police and politicians is truly outrageous. It is certainly not the actions and uh, words of these named members and senators. In fact, hundreds of thousands of Australians have raised these issues, have marched against mandates without incidents, because these are everyday men, women, children, from CEOs to pensioners, pilots, nurses, teachers. They are not enemies of the state. My office have taken scores of calls from doctors, nurses, tradies, truckies, lawyers, cleaners, parents, grandparents, dairy farmers and others against mandates. And I and others in this place have public su publicly supported that view, while Senators Rennick and Antic and Mr Christensen are showing their support in different ways. Vaccination rates in Australia are amongst the highest in the world. Close to 90 per cent of people are getting their advice, their health advice, from doctors, not from politicians. However, it is not that long ago that in Queensland the chief health officer suggested that AstraZeneca was going to kill young people, and that was the beginning of serious concern in our community 
for the AstraZeneca vaccination. But it is Labor playing politics with public health. The Labor candidate for Higgins. Uh, in January of 2021, Dr Ananda Raja tweeted multiple times undermining the effectiveness of, yes, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, she has also, uh, I'm sorry, the doctor has also criticised Doherty Institute Direct Shannon Lewin and ex-Victorian Deputy Chief Health Officer Alan Cheng for lacking any real expertise in pandemic planning or response. And as two of the Australia's foremost public health experts who have worked tirelessly to assist both the Commonwealth and state governments respond to the pandemic and to save lives, Professor Lewin and Dr Chen should be praised for their efforts. And indeed, Labor, this federal Labor opposition, is preferencing an independent COVID anti-vaxxer ahead of the nationals in the upcoming state by-election in Monaro. Extraordinary, the double standards. Now, to coin a now common phrase, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you in Labor look down on those people who have different views to you, Australians who hold different views, smear those with genuinely held concerns and beliefs as would-be thugs and murderers. You want to deny a person's lawful right to speak and protest because Labor is now the epitome of the new sneering elite. The unvaccinated are a minority, but they're not the correct type of minority for Labor, so their views and concerns don't matter. And instead of a crusade against freedom, how about you get into regional Queensland and ask what's important to them. Because in Queensland, my great state, it has been the sort of misinformation uh, that has been spread on social media after comments like those I've already just quoted. The vaccine hesitancy for AstraZeneca allowed, allowed a whole lot of views to grow up. And as a federal government, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been nothing short of world leading. We were able to stem the tide of COVID in this nation, to allow time for people to become vaccinated, to save jobs and save lives, to ensure that we now have an unemployment rate down to 4.2 per cent, that Australians are able to get off social security to have a job, to engage uh, in the world and the life that they want. Because the government's priority is the safety and well-being of all Australians. And to that end, have spent significant money and effort in combating misinformation. There is a COVID-19 misinformation portal, COVID-19 myth-busting on the australia.gov.au website that corrects myths and misinformation. The Department of Home Affairs reviews and refers online misinformation about COVID-19 to social media platforms to request its takedown. And $116.1 million has been committed to the national COVID-19 vaccine campaign. And we know that's been successful because look at our vaccination rates in this country. Because, as I said at the beginning, Australians generally take their medical advice from a health professional, not from politicians, which would be a wise, a wise decision. But this inf misinformation that's been allowed to spread has created genuine, genuine concern in people right across this nation. And it is our responsibility to talk to them to hold out our hand and listen and understand what those genuine concerns are and try and assist them to understand what is the best medical assistance, best medical advice for them, for their families, for their children. That is our role. It is not in any way to look down on these people as somehow being uh, wrong 
or stupid or certainly that they can't hold these views at all. That's not the sort of country we are. And the members and senators who have listened to those people, who are trying to represent their views and ensure that they are heard to allow for better government planning, better government responses, is only the right thing to do instead of this elitist, sneering response from Labor. This holier-than-thou, smarter-than-you, uh, inner-city kind of response that we in regional Australia are sick of. We're sick of feeling disconnected from Labor, of them having no understanding of the genuine industries uh, and infrastructure and concerns that we hold, because we are the part of the nation that does the mining, that, does the, that grows the agriculture and has the terrific communities that we're so very proud of. So I will, I will continue to defend the rights of Mr Christensen and Senators Antic and Rennick yeah, yeah. to support Australians right across this country who have genuine concerns, genuine misgivings, but it's our responsibility to assist them. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam, Acting Deputy, Madam Deputy President. I speak as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia. It's a matter of urgency that our elected parliamentary representatives are increasingly not a reflection of the typical everyday Australian. It's fundamental to our Australian democracy that people can demonstrate against incursions to their freedoms. I applaud any politician who has the guts and the integrity and the resolve to make a stand for the people, even if it is against their party line. Senator Chisholm has done well to show his true self in this MOU when he believes that only good order should reign at the expense of individual voices. Senator Chisholm clearly believes politicians ought not to use their public profile and status to represent the deep concerns of the people. Does Senator Chisholm suggest politicians use their high profile and status to be solely compliant and silent? I believe that politicians have a duty to listen to our con consciences and speak out when we believe it is not in the interests of the Australian people. Senator Chisholm's urgency motion says more about his narrow Labor perspective on life than it does about the topic or about the Australian people. Personally, I'm proud to stand beside anyone who has the courage of their convictions, who is brave enough to take their unpopular stand and risk ridicule for their beliefs. I admire anyone, particularly politicians, who have not lost sight of the Australian people, our democracy, our values and freedoms, and will stand with the people regardless of the party line. I have done so and will proudly continue to do so. Senators Rennick, Antic and Mr George Christensen and Mr Craig Kelly have the mettle to stand for a broader Australia. I support their efforts to question, expose and call out the deliberate misuse and abuse of science, the fraudulent use of science, as a basis for lockdowns and vaccine mandates. Senator Chisholm's motion has demonstrated his belief that there should be only one worldview held by all, held by everyone, and Senator Chisholm will decide what that view is, no matter how far removed this groupthink is from how Australians see ourselves. The good order of the Australian community requires both debate and dissent, compliance and cohesion, and most of all, robustness and honesty. Our social and democratic institutions, failing as they are to protect the rights and freedoms of the people, must be robust enough to, to embrace the debate from the people and from politicians who represent them. Why is there low and declining trust in MPs? Here's a quote from someone today. Declining trust in our institutions is not the problem. It is the solution. We need to have less of the institutions. It's a sad day when any politician whose career and life is predominantly political thinks that his narrow world perspective has any resonance, resonance with the Australian people at large. Senators Rennick, Antic and Mr Christensen are fighting for the people because they themselves are of the people having carved out independent careers from the city to the land, facing uncertainties along the way. 
Senator Hansen and I have this same grounding in real life. From their actions, these representatives, like us, feel what the people are feeling. They know, as One Nation knows, that unnecessary lockdowns, debilitating and inhuman vaccine mandates and an absence of longitudinal testing on vaccines is just not good enough. They know that the people deserve better and are willing to stand up for what is right. They also talk about ivermectin, a, a proven, safe, effective, affordable, accessible treatment that has stopped COVID wherever it's been used properly. And the government falls silent on it, actually withdrew that from the people. The real matter of urgency here is that too many Labor, Liberal, National and Greens politicians do not have the courage to stand against this attack on our freedom and basic human rights. Too many in this place stand meek and silent while businesses fail and everyday Australians are coerced into a repeated, unproven medical experimental procedure in order to feed their families. To feed their families? It's time that gutless groupthink politicians are consigned to the bio-waste bin of history. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Ayres. Well, um, Madam Deputy President, um, this um, debate is in no way a debate about free speech. Australians have free speech. It's in no way a debate about the right to protest. Uh, I've been involved in plenty of protests. Um, this is a debate about political leadership uh, and about whether the office of Prime Minister is going to be used uh, for political leadership. Now, I listened carefully to Senator Macdonald and I have to say that I had no idea until this moment how degraded the Nationals' commitment to political liberalism has become. Former Senator Ron Boswell recognised the threat to Australian democracy that the One Nation Party posed, and he fought them and he opposed them right through Queensland in this place uh, and at the ballot box. Well, the modern National Party just seeks to incorporate them, incorporate those views. They don't recognise the threat to Australian democracy uh, that's posed by the kinds of views being put out there in a systematic way by Mr Christensen. Now, Mr Christensen, in the material that he propagates around the place, supports violent extremism. He cozies up to people who, let's call a spade a spade, are fascists. They are a threat to democracy. Now, I had a look at Mr Christensen's website before coming in here. He caught support from some of the darkest recesses of far-right movements overseas. He has a page there that says, reject the Great Reset. It's got references in the usual anti-Semitic tropes used by these extremists to poor old Mr George Soros. I don't know what he ever did to offend these people, but it's the usual anti-Semitic tropes. New world order, global elites, the kind, the kind of terminology that on that side of this place and in Mr Morrison's office has become a plaything, a political plaything for people who don't recognise the seriousness of the threat and don't understand their political responsibility. This is not about free speech. People can say whatever they like. This is about whether Mr Morrison is prepared to act in the national interest, in the interests of Australian democracy and in the interests of what used to be the party that represented the liberalist trend in Australian political thinking, has now drifted, has now drifted to the far right, not become more conservative, not become more conservative because Traditional conservatives are repulsed. The, the, the former leaders, 
former prime ministers, former liberal leaders, former national leaders, John McEwen would be repulsed by this ideology that's been propagated by this group. Uh, in the United Kingdom, a Labor MP was murdered by people professing the same ideology propagated by Mr Christensen. More recently, a Conservative MP murdered doing their day-to-day -day work as politicians because people like Mr Johnson in the United Kingdom have decided in desperate political circumstances that it's okay to propagate far-right political conspiracy theories and mobilise people around those ideals to try and damage your political opponents. These things have consequences in our democracy. Nobody is arguing that people don't have the right to protest. Nobody is arguing that people don't have the capacity for free speech. What we're after is political leadership. And outside, of course there are people who have different views. More people should listen to the science about the COVID-19 pandemic about the important role that vaccinations must play in keeping us all safe, about the role of the public health measures. There has been enormous pain in our community as a result of the public health measures that have had to be taken, in no small part because of the failure of Mr Morrison to deliver vaccines on time, to get rapid antigen tests out there to ensure that there's personal protective equipment in aged care. These are the things that have driven the pandemic and made things harder for ordinary Australians. But what we've got out the front that Senator Rennick and Senator Antic and Mr Christensen, old Red Pill Rennick and all the others down there urging it on is a group of fascists and fringe dwellers and some fixated persons. A person was arrested out there with a sawn-off rifle last week, and there's people over here and Mr Morrison who think that's not a problem. Like, what does it take for the modern Liberal Party and what passes for the National Party these days to take these things seriously. When people assemble outside parliaments with nooses, it has consequences. It's not reasonable debate. It's a threat of violence. I saw yesterday what happened to the British Labor leader with loops and extremists chasing him down the street. The good work of the protective services in the United Kingdom were what saved him from a very serious assault. Now, the truth is Australians do not support this madness. They have voted with their feet. Well over 90 per cent have received two doses of the vaccine. Australians trust scientists. They trust healthcare professionals and they trust each other. Uh, but Mr Morrison has failed to stand up to the extremists on his own backbench. And we know why. In one of his occasional truth bombs, we had another one last week via text from Mr Joyce, Mr Joyce made it clear why Mr Morrison won't take Mr Christensen on. Because Mr Morrison relies upon Mr Christensen's vote over there in the House, and Mr Joyce relies upon Mr Christensen's vote in the National Party room not prepared, not an ounce of political courage or principle left in this Prime Minister. No courage, no principle has kowtowed to extremists, kowtowed to violent political extremism, and, it's, and as a consequence it's become more and more prominent uh, in the Liberal Party. Now, uh, Mr Christensen still sits in the party room. He still has a vote in the caucus. Uh, and 
Those opposite who know this man much better than we do have known this for a very long time about how dangerously off course he has gone. And I've seen it. I wrote to Minister Andrews in November last year and to the Australian Federal Police when I saw threats of political violence, direct threats, made on Mr Christensen's Telegram account. Well, there's been crickets for Minister Andrews and crickets from Mr Morrison. No capacity, no capacity to stand up. And what do we have revealed today? But Mr Christensen is spending tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money every month, hundreds of thousands of dollars over his term in office, using taxpayers' money, public money, to propagate extremist political ideology and to make things worse, to undermine the public health message. And yet all we have here, and what I anticipate we're about to have, is some quizzling defence based on free speech, as if anybody is arguing here about free speech. We just want a Prime Minister who puts the national interest first, who puts Australia first and puts Australian democracy first. And I'm afraid we're going to have to wait for an election before we get one. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Roberts. What we're witnessing this afternoon is Labor's attempt at a tawdry reinvention of Hillary Clinton's deplorables, a comment which divided the United States society and saw she, who was going to be elected as the President of the United States, defeated by the people of Australia because of their repulsion at this sort of politics that Hillary Clinton failed to execute and, I predict, Labor will fail to execute with this tawdry motion. Isn't it amazing that this, is, that this motion is put forward by a Queensland senator? Queensland, which through its state Labor government was the government that sought to scare people from AstraZeneca. Oh, no mention of that in the contributions, no mention whatsoever. But in the motion, if you read it in detail, these gentlemen are being condemned for being even standing alongside certain people. Well, the acting leader in this place got caught out recently, didn't she? standing alongside operatives of the Communist Party of China, that brutal dictatorship. And there she was standing alongside of such an operative. Do we, does the Labor Party condemn her for that? Stony silence. Or indeed the acting leader of the Labor Party in this place, and I would suggest possibly unwittingly, appointed people that have now served jail terms to her ministry while she was pre a Premier of New South Wales, or indeed the Labor Party. How did they defend the criminally convicted Craig Thompson when he was sitting in the House of Representatives? And the list of Labor debacles in this space goes on and on. One wonders how this Labor motion even saw the light of day. The lack of self-awareness in this motion is genuinely and truly concerning. And in this debate, sure, there is a narrative at the moment as to the best way to deal with COVID. But let's remind ourselves that Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and not in the dark recesses of far-right clutches, but they have just determined to remove all barriers whatsoever in relation to COVID. No more mandates, no more mask wearing, no more limits on crowd numbers, <coughs> based on their medical advice. And so to suggest, listen to the science, is uh, often used as a mantra to shut others down, to cancel them. And there are alternate points of view held by men and women skilled in science, and often they are quoted by my colleagues. Do we agree with them? That's not the issue. 
The issue is, do they have the right to put those views to the public? And they do. And look, just to remind people in this place, men and women of good faith and highly intelligent can actually come to differing conclusions on exactly the same matters. And I refer to the High Court. Seven men and women who are sworn into an office, who are of a high intellect, capable lawyers, they hear the same evidence, apply the same law, and then these seven men and women sometimes come down to a 4-3 decision. Are they somehow in the clutches of some conspiratorial force? No, they're not. They are men and women of good faith who have exercised a judgment in relation to a certain matter. And if high court judges can be so divided on these matters, why can't Australian citizens be divided in relation to mandates, mask wearing, or indeed whether they want to have a vaccine or not? And that is why, Madam Acting Deputy President, I have consistently been against the concept of mandates. I don't want to see a divided society. I don't want to see a two-tiered society based on those that are vaccinated and those that are not vaccinated. Those men and women who make a choice are entitled to their jobs. We are, as we speak, seeing university students in Tasmania being told you cannot continue with your studies if you are not vaccinated, as a result of which their dreams are shattered, the public is denied their expertise, and of course, halfway through, they've got a hex debt that they were expecting to pay off after graduation, now being denied that opportunity, but still left with a debt. The same applies to TAFE in my home state of Tasmania. Completely unacceptable that apprentices should be denied the opportunity. We've got a shortage of tradesmen. We've got a shortage of nurses and all sorts of people, of doctors and surgeons, and they're now being denied the right to practice and being a service to the community. So I happen to be pro-vaccination but anti-mandates. And that is a right and proper position to hold, and I will defend it uh, most uh, vehemently for those that have an alternate view to mine in relation to vaccination. My view has always been that in this debate we should seek to educate and not discriminate. We should seek to convince and not coerce. That is the way a civilised society and community seeks to go about a discussion. And yes, my, uh, what I would say to uh, colleagues and others, if you are so convinced of your position, you should have no fear of an opposite view being put to you. If anything, your counter to that view will show that your initial view is in fact correct. Whereas if you cannot counter it properly, what it informs you to do is to nuance your position to accept that that which has been countering your view has some merit to it and you need to adjust your uh, position. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, what is most disappointing about this debate, not only Labor's hypocrisy in putting forward this motion, but it's the relentless negativity and failure of Labor to put forward an alternate point of view, an alternate platform. Where are they in this debate? Their big criticism is three members of the coalition. You know what? The average Australian is not concerned about two senators and a House of Reps member. They're concerned about the fundamentals of Australian government. Things like, and allow me to read this list, and that is why the Australian Labor Party don't want to talk real policy, but we have had 1.1 million jobs created since the pandemic hit. How about a motion of congratulations in relation to that? Deathly silence from Labor. 11.5 million Australians benefiting from tax relief. 700,000 jobs saved through JobKeeper. 
71.3 per cent of trade and exports are now covered by free trade agreements. 815,600 female business operators in Australia as of August 2021. 220,000 trade apprentices, a record high. 20 per cent reduction in emissions since 2005. Electricity bills down 8 per cent in the past two years. They're the sort of things people talk about. Apprenticeships for their sons and daughters. Their electricity bill. How can they afford to pay it? These are the real issues, and that is what a former Labor Party used to discuss on a regular basis. But today, no, 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 those cost of living issues, those things that are actually discussed under the corrugated iron roofs of our suburbs are no longer the matters that excite the interest of the Australian Labor Party. What excites them are the political stunts and the attempts to try to divide our society between their elitist view of the world, and if anybody disagrees with it, they need to be shut down. But in the moments left, how about 1,213 major transport projects supporting 100,000 jobs? Over 99 per cent of homes and businesses with NBN access. Madam Acting Deputy President, despite the COVID, the Morrison government has done a fantastic job, and all that Labor can point to is some illusory view about three coalition Order, backbenchers. Senator, Abetz. Senator Wish Wilson. To you, Deputy President, uh, to quote Russell Crowe from Gladiator, Senator Abetz, the time for honouring yourself and your government will soon be at an end. Uh, sitting here listening to the achievements of this government, no wonder Australians are so exasperated, so frustrated and despairing at the state of politics in this country. We have maybe five days, five days in this parliament this year, that's it, five sitting days before almost certainly an election, which has to be held for this august chamber by the 22nd of May. And what do we have on the agenda? We have a government fighting culture wars, bringing in a religious discrimination bill to discriminate against transgender individuals, citizens in this country, who have rights. We see exchanges of text messages in the media making up the bulk of news stories between senior members of the LNP, Mr Peter Dutton in the other place, and the Prime Minister, Barn Mr Barnaby Joyce, calling the Prime Minister a psycho and a psychopath and who knows what else. This government is just a long series of dumpster fires. This parliament has been non-stop chaos, scandal, corruption. And in just a few months' time, in fact, in less than 100 days, Australians have a chance to go to the polls and take back the power, take back the power from this government. I and many other Australians are most despairing of the fact that this chaos is distracting from so many important things and so much reform we need in this place. The great challenges of our time. And I accept that COVID has been a very difficult few years for all of us and for all Australians, in fact, the whole international community, and we're not out of the woods yet. But we also are still seeing a relentless assault on our environment by big corporations, hell-bent on propping up their balance sheets, hell-bent on growing their earnings per share so they can keep their share prices up, going out and exploring 80,000 kilometres of new ocean acreage for oil and gas at a time when the International Energy Agency tells us that 2021 has to be the last year 
of oil and gas exploration on this planet. If we were to stick to 1.5 degree warming, I despair when I look at my home state of Tasmania, where the Tarkine is still under assault. Mining company MMG wants to go in to some of the most precious Gondwana rainforests left on this planet, where just recently the Bob Brown Foundation released information that it's a breeding ground for the rare and endangered mast owls, a company that just cares about money and its own profits, building a toxic tailing stamp on a beautiful river in the Tarkine in Gondwana Forest, and in Blue Derby, where mountain biking has turned that town into a transition town. So-called Sustainable Timbers Tasmania want to log right up to the mountain bike tracks, even though the reason that this place has been so successful is because of its beauty and its rareness and its geology. It is on the international map, and yet we still want to log it, even after millions, tens of millions of dollars of federal and state money have gone into investing in a different future to forestry. But we just can't let go. And we see uh, oil and gas companies, as usual, getting the run of the roost in this place. Well, um, Acting Deputy President, it will be different in three months' time. I have absolute faith and confidence that Australians have had enough of the chaos and enough of the corruption, and they want change. I believe that, and I believe I'll be vindicated on election night. We can take this country in a new direction. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And it's just interesting to listen to the contributions uh, this evening uh, by senators in this place. I guess for the past two years, Australians have come together to get through this pandemic. And I, essentially, that's been the core message uh, from the motion of Senator Chisholm, how many Australians are coming together and have come together to get through these very difficult and unprecedented times. However, by respecting um, one another and receiving advice from leaders and experts, we have kept our friends and families and many other loved ones uh, throughout our various communities in which we represent, uh, uh, which are represented in this place, safe. Of course, there have been rules that have been difficult to follow, um, and there have been different rules in different parts of the country. But some directions that might not have been um, intuitive sense to some of us, but the vast majority of Australians have understood that defeating COVID is the core goal here. Defeating COVID is important because if we don't, then there will be other consequences that we'll face. And what we are seeing around the world is those that have not been at the front of the curve. We've seen thousands upon thousands upon thousands of deaths every single week. But despite the uh, Morrison-Joyce government completely bungling the vaccine rollout, most Australians have turned up to get their jab as soon as they could. But one must say that was because of many decisions that were taken by state governments rather than by the federal government. And many of these Australians, in fact over 90 per cent of these Australians, the vast majority of Australians have trusted the science. They've trusted their doctors. They have trusted the many experts in the healthcare professions. And they got vaccinated, not just to protect themselves, but to protect their loved ones. Now, this trust is, as fuss is the very foundation of our society. None of us can be an expert on everything. And I don't think anyone in this place claims to be. But we do trust in others to provide us with that advice and the guidance on very complicated and complex issues. That's why we have departments. That's why we do listen to experts. And I know there are many, many individuals in this place and in the other place who are very sceptical about some of the advice that they receive. But thankfully, the vast majority of us do take on advice from scientists. Certain members of the government, 
and many have been outlined in uh, Senator Chisholm's motion, have consistently undermined and attacked the information that Australians are relying on to keep them safe. And that is core to our debate today. Members of this government have used their platforms as elected representatives to spread mistruths and disinformation about vaccines and about other important public health measures. You know, it's interesting to listen to those opposites who claim that we somehow are lecturing them, but you do listen to the contributions that were made. And one might have to say that uh, you know, it is a bit of a lecture from others to tell us that we are wrong when we point out the very point that when we do listen to health experts, that they should be taken seriously. Yes, they can be critiqued, and yes, we should be able to question the advice. But at the end of the day, when you have multiple, multiple health experts around the country in very different jurisdictions saying the same thing, one has to say, how can they be wrong? But these members of the government have stoked the flames of division in our communities, feeding the worst of our instincts. They have done their best to turn Australians against each other rather than uniting them. And thanks to those, some Australians now no longer trust their family doctor. And if you believe some of their harmful ideas, our hardworking nurses and paramedics are all part of a worldwide conspiracy instead of the selfless heroes that most of us know that they are. So instead of focusing on creating jobs and cutting bills, members of this government are detracting from the efforts of all Australians to beat this virus Order. and get Senator on with their Shikani. lives. Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Deputy uh, President, I had a more well, fulsome speech prepared, but uh, given the lateness of the hour, I won't. So I'll just make this point. Getting vaccinated is a sensible and responsible thing to do, and that's why West, uh, Australians have taken up the opportunity to go and do that. But I have to say I am against the mandation of vaccination. In my home state, we are seeing uh, extraordinary measures being taken to uh, coerce people to get vaccinated. As I said, it's a sensible and responsible thing to do. I myself am triple dosed, uh, and I encourage people to do it. But you can't even go to a drive through bottle shop in Western Australia without showing your vaccination certificate. That's just a vindictive attitude that I think the state government has taken uh, against Western Australians, that on the balance of all the evidence they've got, they have decided for themselves that they don't want that medical procedure. Now, they're only putting themselves at risk. The data is showing that you're protecting yourself, but it's not doing much actually to reduce transmission. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, it being 7.20 p.m., pursuant to order agreed to earlier today, the debate is now interrupted, and I will put the question. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. I'll just give the whips a few more moments. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the noes. There being 24 ayes, 27 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Uh, I'll give the senators a moment to leave the chamber. I will be calling the clerk. We will be moving to government business. <laughs>